All right, we are live, ladies and gentlemen. Heartland Socialism Research Center just released a new book, Socialism at a Glance. Socialism at a Glance attempts to fill an educational deficiency, providing a succinct summary of socialism's origins and rise in modern history, while also giving detailed case studies of some of the most infamous socialist regimes that rose to power in the 20th century, including some that still exist to this day. Also, in is the political rhetoric in America getting more polarized? Are the left getting further to the left and the right getting further to the right? Is this sustainable? Join us as we talk about all these topics and more on episode 443 of the In the Tank podcast. <laughs> Yeah, welcome to the In the Tank podcast. As always, I'm your host, Donald Kendall. And joining me today, I do not have Jim Lakely. He is in the background because he is too sick to be on screen. But I do have one of your favorites, Chris Talgo, editorial director here at the Heartland Institute. How are you doing today, Chris? Well, Donnie, it would be nice if the sun actually made an appearance in Chicago because it's been, what now, four straight days of grayness and rain and snow this is not good for my mental health. That's all I can yeah. tell you. It's a great spring. It's a great spring. Yes. Also a fan favorite. We have Linnea Lucan. She is a research fellow with the Arthur B. Robinson Center on Climate and Environmental Policy. How are you doing, Linnea? I'm doing much better. It is sunny and 65 degrees, a little windy. Uh, but uh, Chris, I, I don't think I ever went through a spring in Chicago that wasn't precisely what you just, just described there. Maybe sometimes a good couple inches of slush that's also gray on the ground. So, you know, there's yeah. that. At least it's not that bad. The big problem for me this year, and Donnie, you can attest to this, is that we've had some really nice days in like late February. We had like a couple days in the 70s. So that just like got my entire like, <laughs> like my, my clock all messed up. And now it's like, why is it so cold and gray all, all the time? But whatever. yeah, yeah, flowers were sprouting, uh, yeah. you know, trees were budding, and then yesterday we got like three inches of snow. <laughs> so, yeah, so yeah, been a typical spring in the Chicago land, but that's not what we're here to talk about. We've got a whole lot of stuff to talk about. I've got a bunch of topics packed in without uh, certain people, you know, doing certain types of gym rants, we might be able to get through a handful of topics. I see Jim kind of smirking in the background, but that's all right. But uh, so Linnea Lucan, she's a staple on the Climate Realism Show on Heartland's main YouTube channel, which uh, the show appears, it's broadcast every Friday at noon central time on uh, YouTube, X, Rumble, Facebook, wherever you want to catch it. And uh, Lene, you've been doing a lot of work on the Climate at a Glance project. We are currently preparing a series of videos on a whole variety of climate topics, very short videos that cover uh, topics, just kind of summarizing different topics, dispelling myths, what have you. But we also have a new Climate at a Glance app. So can you just tell us maybe about the app and uh, just the project in general? Yeah, sure. So um, we're doing a video series on almost every single topic that's covered on the Climate at a Glance app. Um, we spent a very high speed couple of days filming all of the videos at once. So mm -hmm. that was a pretty exhausting week for us, but um, it went really well, I think, and I'm excited to see how the final project turns out. Um, the app is basically the same content that we have on the website or um in the book, although we do have some new stuff from the website that didn't make it to the hard copy book. Um, it's really, really a good fast reference um, for those of you who like to uh, screenshot graphics and spam them in the replies <laughs> under some alarmists uh, comment. It's a terrific resource for that. Plus it has all the genuine references. So, you know, when someone accuses you of doing that, you, <laughs> you can pull the actual reference as well. Um, and so actually do the, do your reading and everything, um, which is unheard of sometimes on certain corners of the internet. Uh, so it's a really good reference. I highly recommend it. Um, 
if anyone ever comes across any issues or anything, let us know with it so that we can fix them right away. We're really trying to make sure that this is a really good product. So, um, and it's free. So that's always fun and good. So please yeah. download it. Right. There's the little uh, cool little QR code thing on the side there. So you can just directly download it from there. Or if you are an audio only listener, I'm sure you can go to climate at a glance.com and surely at the very top, you'll see a featured slide or whatever that uh, will direct you to where you can download the app. But uh, Linnea, is there a particular climate or maybe even energy myth that uh, that's uh, that's out there that just particularly puts you on tilt when you hear it? <laughs> just, oh. one, just one, just one, just one, your top one. That's really very difficult. Um, I think the the most odious of them all is also, I think, the video that we're probably going to release first, and that's the consensus narrative, mm. uh, because it's uh, patently nonsense to say that consensus should be the one and only thing that you depend. I, I'm going to stop myself for a second. Sometimes, you know, just because there's a overwhelming consensus does not mean that they're correct, but other times there actually isn't a consensus. And in this case, uh, that's definitely true with the climate issue. Um, that's not to say that just because something is generally agreed upon in scientific communities that it's wrong or that we should be automatically suspicious of it. But in terms of the climate argument, usually it goes something like 97% of scientists agree that climate change is an existential threat. And when you actually dig into the polling, that's not really what people are saying when, you know, these organizations like the um, American Meteorological Society uh, would say. Usually it's something more like most scientists agree that the average Earth's temperature and the average climate of the planet uh, is changing since the last ice age, which come as no surprise, right. and that human beings may have um, different degrees of impact on that. And I think that that's relatively uncontroversial, but usually what happens is the alarmists take that and run with it and claim that what the agreement is, is that there's this looming catastrophe that if we don't give up eating meat and give up our cars and live in the darkness, <laughs> like right now, um, that the planet is going to explode or something. And that's mm -hmm. really not the true consensus. Yeah, so it's not every week that we have a uh, an energy expert on with us. So I'm going to take this opportunity. I know this isn't in the show notes or anything like that, just to pick your brain about a couple of things. Um, so just recently, I was, uh, for constant listeners, it, it shouldn't be a shock uh, that I'm super into the artificial intelligence concept, uh, the, the industry, the development of all of those things. So recently, I was watching a podcast with Sam Altman, who's the CEO of uh, OpenAI. And he was talking about how in the future he foresees computing power being like the most valuable resource. Um, and he says that depending on the price of that computing power, you know, we can achieve A, B, C or D. Uh, and then the the interviewer asked them, well, what's what's like the defining things, uh, factors that uh, that will determine what the cost of that computing power is? And in his short list, he said energy. So then the guy said, OK, well, what's your solution to that? And without hesitation, Sam Altman says nuclear power, whether it's fission or fusion, like that's that's the thing that he's pushing. And and Chris and I were just talking about this yesterday. That There seems to be almost like a contradiction on the left where you've got, uh, you know, the, the vast majority of the left is pushing for wind and solar as the only options uh, for energy in the future. But then you've got the kind of the big tech left, or at least that we generally put them in that category, like people like Sam Altman, that their whole industries run on energy. They need cheap, reliable, mass amounts of energy. So what are your thoughts on the idea of like nuclear, whether it's fission or fusion, for the future of our energy source. Right. Well, I like, I mean, I've got nothing against nuclear whatsoever. I like the idea of the micro reactors that they have. Um, nowadays are, I'll back up a second. The main opposition that I have seen, sometimes they'll say that cost is a problem because the startup costs on nuclear are pretty high, um, but that's kind of a non-issue when you're already spending like a bazillion dollars and throwing it at wind and solar and it's <laughs> and it, there's apparently no end to it. Um, the 
And offshore wind is certainly very expensive as well, and they're doing it anyway. So obviously that's not a legitimate argument. Um, what seems to me to be the largest issue is still that NIMBY issue or the um, kind of this latent paranoia about nuclear energy that was born from people who witnessed Three Mile Island and Chernobyl and stuff like that. Um, or Fukushima more recently, even though that didn't end up being nearly the catastrophe that it was kind of hyped to be. Um, the, the main issue is um, that people have a, a terror of nuclear that is kind of outdated at this point, because most nuclear power systems that go up nowadays are going to be ones that have like a safety built in, like they're not going to melt down the way that old nuclear plants could melt down. They like turn themselves off <laughs> instead of exploding, you know? Um, so there really isn't that, that safety issue, you know, and people will bring up disposal issues and that certainly is an issue, but that's more of an issue that government has created because they made it more complicated and more difficult uh, to store nuclear material. And there are some new technologies that are emerging that can kind of reuse some of that stuff anyway. Um, I also, uh, I think that one, you know, the cynical side of my brain says, well, the Greens don't want nuclear because it would work. <laughs> right. That's that's probably one of the biggest ones. Um, but also, I think that a lot of them are just like scared of, of the technology and um, they, they associate it with being dirty because they see the big uh, cooling towers and stuff mm -hmm. that are similar to the cooling towers that coal plants have. Um, so there's a lot of kind of mythology around it. But the truth is, nuclear makes would make up a fantastic base load. But it's not terrific at adapting quickly to changes in power demand. For instance, you know, if you had all of a sudden like this heat dome pop up very rapidly, um, and everyone switches on their air conditioners in an area. Uh, nuclear can't necessarily be cranked up to accommodate that. So nuclear actually works best when it's paired up with something like coal or natural gas. So, you know, this isn't to say I, I'm, I'm very skeptical that nuclear could make up the entire energy load. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I just wonder, you know, after listening to Sam Altman talking about it, I'm just like, is there like a like a weird partnership in the, in the like the potential for a weird partnership between like kind of conservative energy, you know, wonks and stuff and like big tech? It's like, hey, you know, you can't just keep running to the left. They're just going to yeah. keep trying to throw solar panels at you. It's like, you know, <laughs> we you might be able to get some people on the right to, to propose nuclear. I just wonder if there's like an eventual team up I, uh, well, that's inevitable. I, just, just real quick, I, I, I think part of the reason why they are so not willing to give nuclear uh, a proper shot is because there's not oodles of money to be made in it. And uh, as we've seen, you know, it's, I mean, Donnie, BlackRock, uh, Larry Fink has said, you know, this would, this is, this energy transition on a worldwide level is going to be a just trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars. So I think one of the reasons why they are so insistent that. We must get rid of fossil fuels and replace them with only solar and wind is because there is ample money to be made with government contracts, cronyism all throughout, you know, that that system. And look at the uh, uh, the infrastructure law that uh, Joe Biden passed now two two plus years ago. They said that they would uh, have thousands and thousands of charging stations built by now. Guess how many they built? Seven. So, <laughs> yeah, I know. I mean, well, it's just. You're absolutely right, Chris. And I've I've pointed this out in a article that I think I talked about on this show before, where I compared um, wind and solar to like the fast fashion industry. Mm -hmm. Wind and solar are fantastic if you want to make a ton of money because they're relatively cheap to put up, especially with the government um, uh, subsidies and whatnot. And <laughs> They break <laughs> all the time. Mm -hmm. They do not last the amount of time that they're supposed to last. So there's a huge amount of money to make there. I mean, just look at the huge um, solar farm that just got obliterated by a hailstone, uh, uh, by a hailstorm in Texas. Um, it's, uh, it is, it's, it's very, I, I think it's very easy to compare it to fast fashion where the point is this thing breaks or it gets worn out early and you throw it away and you buy another one. Um, it's, 
not very sustainable, I don't think. No, <laughs> but, no, definitely not. That's that's a topic of a whole nother podcast. Yeah. But, uh, but we should probably move on to our main topic. Um, we do potentially, depending on how fast we move through these these next few topics, we might have another uh, climate change related thing towards the end of the show, but we will see. So another project of the Heartland Institute is the brand new release of Socialism at a Glance, as I mentioned at the front of the podcast. The book is the focal point of what I like to call in the office Socialism Classic. So under the Socialism Research Center banner, we cover a lot of stuff, a, a whole wide range of issues from digital currencies, ESG, the Great Reset, I don't know, you name it. And uh, they sure, they all have a collectivist mindset, but it's still a wide range nonetheless. Socialism at a glance is Socialism Classic. The book is a short, concise it examines various aspects of the political ideology that is socialism. The book gets into socialism's origins and the rise of socialism in modern history. It provides detailed case studies of some of the most infamous socialist regimes, including the USSR, China, Cuba, North Korea, several other ones. But uh, Chris, you were the um, you you led the charge on on the creation of this book. So, what was the original mindset for you, at least, behind the creation of Socialism at a Glance? Hmm. Uh, great question. Um, for me, the original intention uh, was to get something out into the uh, uh, teaching atmosphere that is a truthful analysis of socialism, uh, both historical perspective and um, the ideology itself. Um, I am a former uh, social studies public high school teacher. I taught in the Chicagoland area and I taught in South Carolina for several years. I taught U.S. history, taught uh, world history, and I taught American government. And I can tell you uh, with a straight face that the vast majority of my teaching colleagues, even in South Carolina, in a pretty conservative area of South Carolina, were preaching socialism and in their classrooms as as a great thing. It's just that it hasn't been implemented properly yet. Um, one of the books that they uh, used over and over again was Howard Zinn's A Young People's History of the United States. Howard Zinn is an avowed socialist, and the entire book is through the perspective of a socialist mindset, class warfare, oppressor, oppressee, all that kind of stuff. So when I was you know, designing lessons and curricula with you know, fellow teachers, I was just shocked at how little there was available for a, uh, a truthful um, presentation of socialism. Uh, we felt that there was a void in the market. So we thought that it would be a very good idea to produce something that is short, to the point, uh, understandable, very relatable. Um, it is filled with uh, original uh, uh, sources and, you know, speeches and quotes from these people. This is not us, um, you know, commenting on socialism, like at mm -hmm. all. This is a impartial, a non-biased, just fact-based approach to socialism. And uh, I think it would be a very valuable resource in schools across the country and also just in homes across the country for, you know, people to understand socialism. And, uh, you know, one other quick thing, um, you know, polling shows that young Americans in particular have become infatuated with socialism. Some of them, 70% uh, on, on some uh, say that they will uh, vote for a socialist. 50% plus have a positive view of socialism. And the reason why is because the public education system has been absolutely derelict in its duty of teaching properly socialism. So, you know, there's a giant void there. And we wanted to at least fill that void with something that is uh, easy for students to understand and tells the story of socialism. Uh, replete with many, many examples of uh, modern uh, socialist nations, including uh, present day China. Yeah, I will say, uh, you know, because I was also part of the whole production of all of this. And one of the things that we kept talking about throughout the production, the writing of the book was like, let's make this ob as objective as possible, right? Like, Yes. Like leave, leave your biases at the door. Like, let's just look at it. Like the, just the kind of the, uh, from like the, the, uh, not justifications for it, but what's like compelling people to look at this as a possible solution and where they're right about that and, and where they're wrong and just kind of like the, the black and white of the matter. So that's, mm -hmm. uh, hopefully is seen throughout the book. Um, but Chris, yeah, you mentioned 
the kind of the younger generations and this is kind of geared towards the younger generations we we almost had it as like a teachers and students kind of guide uh, but we kind of scrapped that kind of at the last minute because we wanted this to kind of appeal to everybody mm -hmm. but if you look at this that we have on the screen this is some polling uh that was done somewhat recently i don't know what the year is but uh exclusive poll young americans are embracing socialism and if you go down a little bit and show that chart, Jim. Some of the findings are pretty, pretty crazy. So it breaks it down from just kind of like your average citizens uh, versus your millennials and Gen Z generations views on some of these questions. One of them being the top one being government should provide universal health care. 73% of the younger two generations are in favor of that. Uh, that is uh, three in four, just about. Government should provide free college tuition. Almost 70% of millennials and Gen Z support that one. And then my favorite one, would you prefer to live in a socialist country? Just about 50%. We'll round up 49.6%. 50% half of Gen Z slash millennials say that they would prefer to live in a socialist country. So, uh, Lene, I want to go to you on this um what, what's what's your perspective on all of this whether it's just socialism in general or the younger generations seemingly embracing of that ideology i'm a little bit skeptical about this poll just based on interactions that i have with a lot of um gen zers out in the wild and also online um of course my online activity is going to be filtered somewhat by the kind of people that I like to talk to. And so it's going to lean more conservative, but uh, I'd, I'd like to see the, uh, the polling, like the database that they used for this and the methodology, because if this is the exact wording that they use, then that's um, sort of alarming. But a lot of the times on these kinds of polls, they use a wording that's a little bit opaque to most people. So I'd be curious, but um, in general, it doesn't come as a huge surprise to me uh, because like Chris said, the uh, like public education in this school is, is highly, you know, it highly favors socialism and socialist. When I was in school, when uh, a teacher would give an example of like a socialist country, they would uh, give the example of Sweden or something, Exactly. which of course we don't know. So, so uh, you know, they're not using like Venezuela or whatever as an example for this. So I think people's ideas are probably quite a bit skewed. Um, it's well, you, uh, yeah. There's well, a that, lot that, to say about why Sweden well, is the way it is. But. Well, that, okay. So that, that I think is a very interesting point. Uh, the idea that, um, you know, and I would, I would bet, I would love a follow-up question. Those 50% of Gen Z is like, all right, well, which socialist country, right? And I guarantee they're not saying China. They're not no. saying, oh, I wish I could go back to the, the Soviet Union or something like that. Surely their answer would be like, I don't know, Sweden. That, that seems pretty good. Yeah. I mean, and there's, then, there's uh, like, a handful of like legitimate tankies out there, but I don't think that most of them fall under that category. Right, right. And, and then those people on that side, you know, the left will accuse us of being like, well, when they say socialist, they don't actually mean what real socialism is. They mean Venezuela. So there almost seems to be this like divide in how we define the term socialism or define the the uh, ideology of socialism. And again, I think that's kind of what we are trying to dispel. We're trying to give like a concrete definition of socialism, what it is, what it means for a country in the book, Socialism at a Glance. But what it definitely is not is uh, a government program. It's like, you know, you see the comments and stuff online of people being like, oh, you don't like socialism? Well, then you better not allow, uh, allow the snow plow to, to get the snow off of your road or something like that, as if that is what socialism is, which is ridiculous, right? It, like, even, even if you take it to, like, a larger degree, socialism is not a, a free market economy with government programs, even big government programs. That's yeah. not socialism. Even even something as big as like universal health care or something. Exactly. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, they are, you know, Sweden uh, is basically a market economy with some large government programs. And then they have to pay for those large government programs with massive taxes. But that's not socialism. 
Right, yeah, but Chris, Donnie, but 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 the difference in Sweden is that uh, it's a it's a relatively flat tax that all the people pay. It's not oh, sure. a progressive tax like we have here in the United States. So when I when I talk to people about the Nordic, the myth of Nordic socialism, and you start to point these things out, where in the United States, one the top one percent and the top ten percent pay like ninety something percent of all taxes, and the bottom fifty percent actually get a huge uh, check from the government, even if mm -hmm. they don't work. Uh, and then you you explain, but in, in Sweden and in Norway, actually everyone works and everyone pays a high tax rate because they've all, first of all, because it's very homogeneous. It's, a, it's, it's, a, it's culturally homogeneous. They've all, you know, basically agreed upon that, you know, that kind of a lifestyle here in the United States. We were not founded on those principles. We were founded on uh, meritocracy. We were founded on, if you go work hard, you can start a business. You can do whatever you want to do. Europe is coming from a very different historical perspective. They were very hierarchical, monarch monarchical in many senses. So they had that that sort of um, that uh, almost like caste system in place. So but the United States has never had that. And they what they want to do is they want to uh, revise history to say that actually the United States has has had all these uh, uh, pseudo socialist uh, types of programs in place. And if we would just implement them in full, then we will achieve it. That is not true. That is not true whatsoever. So, you know, th there's there's another aspect of it that uh, you think we have to touch upon, and that is that uh, we 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 go through the Communist Manifesto, which is the Bible of socialism. And we also talk about how every single socialist nation in history has bought into the, uh, the, the this this notion that you have to change humanity. You actually right. have to you have to actually change the human mindset to make socialism compatible with uh, the the populace, and that 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 is a core element, core tenet of socialism, is that you have to remake humanity. In the Soviet Union, they called it the new man and the new woman, because you have to actually disavow uh, things that are so so you know uh, important uh, to mm -hmm. to human beings, whether it's personal freedom, uh, the ability to own private property, all of those things, general fairness. Socialism throws all that on its head and it just says, OK, the people in power, they get to make all the decisions and everyone else is just at the bottom of society has to live by the dictates of the people at the very top who actually do not live the socialist uh, lifestyle that they have been preaching uh, to the masses. Right, right. Yeah, it's um, it's this idea that it runs counter to human nature to if I work harder but I don't get any more reward, then why would I work harder, right? And so like these, these socialist regimes throughout history recognize that and have to, instead of incentivizing people to work harder, they have to be compelled to work harder. And a lot of that comes with force. Uh, a lot of regimes resorted to that, but a lot of it comes to some weird coercion and manipulation. Um, you mentioned like the, the Soviet new man and like the a lot of psychology kind of stems from this search of how to compel people to do what's good for the collective and not necessarily for themselves, uh, which is a, a fascinating topic that, you know, we a can lot probably of that, go in. A lot of that starts in, in, in the education system in these countries. And we, 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 we highlight that how in uh, Nazi Germany, which was national socialist, it was not uh, a far right uh, government by any sense of the word. That is just a complete and utter myth too, just like Nordic socialism in, uh, in Germany, in Nazi Germany, in the Soviet union, in present day China in Cuba, Venezuela, uh, the uh, North Korea, what they do is they take the the young students and they brainwash them and they brainwash them to become loyal socialists. And that is, you know, a, a very potent way of, uh, you know, making the, 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 the population, you know, accede to the wants and desires of those in power. And one of the one of the other reasons why we wrote this book is because that is happening in America. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons, you know, not to get too off subject here that that's happening is teacher colleges. And I went through a very, uh, you know, a, 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 a high ranking teacher college in the Chicagoland area in the early 2000s while I was pursuing my master's degree. I was completely shocked at the socialist indoctrination that they were, uh, you know, bringing into the teacher colleges. And this has been going on for decades. And I was not alone. Uh, many of the, the uh, colleagues in, in my cohort we were all like, wow, what is going on? Like, but but the problem was you had to kind of go along to get along because if you actually said, hey, wait a second, I don't agree with this. This is this is not right. You wouldn't graduate the program. You wouldn't be employed. 
So I think many of them actually, as the program went on, because it was a three-year program, they just became more and more willing to accept it. Some of us, we, we maintained our, you know, independent thought, but that's why I think when I actually got to the, to the high schools that I was teaching at in both Illinois and in South Carolina, it was just the, the norm that the social studies department, the English department in particular, were full of socialist, uh, you know, ideologues. It is right. just, that is a fundamental, like, fact. You, I mean, I, I'm telling you, I've, I've experienced this in, you know, dozens and dozens of uh, classrooms when I was doing my student teaching, my observing and my actual teaching. I mean, th that that is the norm. The norm is that these students are being uh, groomed to uh, to accept socialism as the as the future. And that is why those polls are showing that it is becoming so popular among them. And why this matters is because these are our future leaders. These are our future business leaders. These are our future political leaders. These are our future social and societal leaders. We do not want them to have this, you know, this, this, this terrible, uh, you know, misguided uh, message that, hey, socialism is great. It just hasn't been implemented properly yet. But in the United right. States, we have the resources. We have the means. We can do it. We have to push back against that message. Yeah, it's weird because kind of the push for socialism has its ebbs and flows, right? I remember when Bernie Sanders was kind of getting out onto the national attention for like the first time. I think that was maybe in 2016, 2015, lead up to the 2016 election, something around right around that time. And I remember when people were like supporting him, you know, like his democratic socialism. I was like shocked. I was like, really, people like we're going back to socialism. I, I didn't realize that. And then that lasted for a little bit, uh, kind of a while. And then, you know, when he took a big fall in 2019, it was like, all right, socialism seems to be over, <laughs> you know, but like, I... surely it's just a matter of time before it really reemerges. And we've got like all of these different headwinds that we're going up against because you've got the captured education system. You've got the, you know, general liberal mainstream media. You've got all these other captured institutions and all of it is masked, not as like, you know, like what we recognize socialism as is like these people that are just vying for control over society. If I had my hands on the control, then everything would be utopian like that. But like, Below that, like a, a level below that, that captures the attention of the younger generation. And, and you know, if, if you disagree with this, let me know. But to me, it, it all seems like it's justified under this like feeling of empathy, right? Like we need to care for our fellow citizens, you know, like I'm my brother's keeper or whatever. So we have to make sure that we're all just helping everybody. And socialism is the best way to do that. Capitalism is <sighs> leaving them in the gutter and socialism is the way to do it. You, I feel yeah, like that's the mindset, right? I, I, I agree with you that there's a sense of noblesse oblige to this, that they think, oh, these people are just, you know, not capable of actually like, you know, organizing themselves and in, 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 in governing themselves. So therefore it's just better if we do it for them. But just a couple of quick points. The Young Democrats uh, Socialists of America, it, their um, membership base is growing by leaps and bounds. So sure. trust me, socialism is not going anywhere, especially among the youth. Um, another reason why I think the youth are more uh, open to socialism is because we don't actually uh, live in a free market economy. And for most of young Americans, they have had a really bad experience with, quote unquote, free market capitalism because we live in a crony capitalist America. And when you look at 2008, when the big banks got bailed out and all that kind of stuff and what's happening now with all this inflation and just all this funny money creation and all that, that's why I think so many young Americans are saying, man, capitalism sucks. I can't right. get, I can't buy a house, man. It's everything's so expensive. It's, it's all the greedy, you know, capitalists. That is so far from the truth. The right. truth is that actually the, the, the big government programs and the, the, the stupid energy policies are what's driving lots of this. So mm -hmm. Bernie Sanders, I think he's actually hitting upon a, a segment of the population that is extremely frustrated with the status quo. And it's funny because Donald Trump had that same message in 2016 and is doing it again in 2024 saying the game is rigged the, the you know the, the the big corporations you know they they run things they're in collusion with the government and it's not an actual free market system so i think we're we're, we're we can't say oh socialism is terrible but the way things are is great because no we aren't living in a in a in a you know robust free market economy right now and that's why i i i, I hope 
that we return to that. Because if we return to that, and then these these young people say, wow, look at all the opportunities that are abounding because of, you know, free market capitalism and low tax rates, low, low regulations, you know, just, you know, all that good stuff that they would probably actually change their mind. But they have this very warped sense of both socialism and capitalism, mm -hmm. which is like just making this, you know, this this poisonous mixture where they're like desperate and saying, well, you know what, if the government's just going to provide me everything. Yeah, that kind of just sounds good on its face. Obviously, they're not digging deeper into that. Yeah, Linnea, I mean, Bernie Sanders, I, I think he did have a way of kind of tapping into a lot of the things that Chris is talking about. Chris, I completely agree with basically everything that you said there. The problem, though, with the modern socialist move movement is that Bernie Sanders is like 85 years old and looks like the high sparrow from Game of Thrones. Right. So my fear is that we are like one charismatic, younger, fresh uh, politician that embraces socialism away from like a major resurgence in, in the push for for this ideology. Um, are you as concerned about that as I am? I'd argue it's already too late. It's already happened. <laughs> the dem mm. the main Democrat party basically has adopted all these principles into their platform already. So that ship sailed, I think. You know, they're already all on board with it. There's no with with very few exceptions, there are no like free market blue dog Democrats left. Um, they're all pretty darn far left at this point. Um, it was one of the things that drove me nuts when I was in college was all these um, older conservatives, um, especially of the like baby boomer generation who would look at my peers who were uh, nuts and they would say, well, you know, don't worry about that because when they get out of college and get into the real world, they're going to abandon all that loony stuff and they're going to get a job and 2.5 kids and a house and blah, blah, blah. Well, guess what happened? <laughs> they all went into government <laughs> and, <laughs> right. and, uh, and they're running or like HR departments of major corporations. And they kept all of those loony beliefs. They did not get punched in the face by reality because reality is catering to them at this point. Sure. Um, the systems are catering to that ideology. So, uh, no, that's it's it's seriously an uphill battle at this point for us. Sorry to drop a little bit of a black pill on that one, but that's it's it's a major problem. And uh, I'm not sure how, you know, I don't really have a solution for that other than I don't know, but making it like socially intolerable to be one of those crazy people. But uh, don't know how that happens yeah, in the right. current system. So I don't know. <laughs> well, Jim is in the background giving a prediction that AOC will be the Democratic presidential candidate as soon as she is old enough. So I'm very curious in the comments for everyone that is watching this, uh, whether or not you agree with Jim's prediction in the background. He is uh, too sick to be on the screen, but not sick enough to give predictions uh, based on our podcast content here. So very curious if you agree with Jim, will AOC inevitably be a candidate, a uh, presidential candidate for the Democratic Party moving forward. Uh, one other thing that I want to uh, touch on on this topic of the Socialism at a Glance book is the kind of, um, maybe it's a acknowledgement of some of the things that we're saying, and that is a push in the state of Florida to create curriculum standards around the idea of teaching students in the public school system about the realities, I'll say, of socialism and communism. So, Chris, I mean, government mandates, uh, mandating curriculum. I, I feel like there's libertarians out there that would, uh, you know, be a stick in the mud when it comes to this. What do you think about this proposal? Generally, I'm against government mandates, but seeing as how I know how the education system works, the states produce what are called standards. And uh, then at the local level, each and every district has to abide by those standards. And, you know, when I was teaching um, U.S. history in particular, I mean, they lay out you have to you have to talk about all of these things and you have to do it in this in this way so that they, you know, they literally say the students must understand blah, 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 blah. And those standards are very uh, leftist. They've been they've been just, you know, taken over by um uh, you know, left leftist ideologues. And it is definitely necessary to get some pushback in the, um, the public education system. And if it does mean passing a law where it says, hey, you got to spend, you know, at least a little bit of time uh, 
talking about, you know, communism and socialism, that, that to me is a good thing. But here's the problem with it, because I taught in South Carolina and we had at the time uh, we had one, I think it was a like one hour, one hour uh, on Constitution Day where we had to talk about the Constitution and such. And I would, you know, listen to the other teachers in my department and they would say, fine, yeah, I'll do it. But I'm just going to badmouth the Constitution. And I'm just, you know, like, I'll do it, but I'm, I'm, I'm not going to actually, you know, do it in good faith. And no one's there. No one's no one's watching. No one's you know sitting there documenting what's what's actually going on. Um, you know, I know this is totally out of, you know, left field here. But one uh, one thing that I think could actually be a potential solution is putting cameras in the classroom. Public schools, I think, should have cameras in the classroom so that the, the uh, so that the parents in particular can watch and see, wow, that's that's what's being taught to my kids. Like I had no clue because during the pandemic, when everything went online, I was still in contact with many of my teacher friends. And, you know, they were just like, oh, my gosh, like parents are like contacting me like this is so annoying. It's and I kind of was like, actually, that's the way it should be. You should not have just utter monopolistic control over your students' minds where you want to shape them the way that you want to shape them, which is basically what they told me was their objective to make them great little social justice, you know, warriors. And, you know, when the parents actually found out about some of this stuff, they were really, really, you know, frustrated. But then again, you know, it's, it, it, it's so difficult for them to really understand and know what's going on in the classroom. So I think, you know, something like this would help. But I think more importantly, just having, you know, uh, transparency in the classroom would be a humongous help. Jim in the background, the don't, <laughs> the don't say Che Bill. <laughs> oh, oh Jim. You're that is good. Bad that, that's good. <laughs> that is like, some good stuff really right good. there. Yeah, that is good. Um, Lene, any thoughts on this idea of having a, a bill mandating some sort of uh, socialism and communism realism curriculum in the state of in Florida. And hopefully maybe, well, no, actually go ahead. What's your opinion? On it? Um, I, I, I think if it is written well, then it's good. If it's not, then it's just a waste of everybody's time. I haven't looked into it too closely yet. Um, I, I agree with Chris that there's a high likelihood that teachers will say, okay, we'll talk about communism and then they'll, go on for <laughs> some of them will go on for however long if you get if you have some kind of a communist in the classroom they're going to take that hour to to spend it talking about how the cool eggs deserved what they got oh, you God, know <laughs> like something demented like that um i uh, so i don't know if it will help without also implementing something that chris like the way that chris uh, said that maybe cameras in the classroom might be a solution to that um it kind of seems this kind of this kind of thing that you can't really enforce always seems kind of uh, performative to me. Um, I think it's a good idea if it can be actually like implemented and enforced, but I'm not confident that it can be with the way that public schools are. Yep. So I, I think uh, Chris told me this yesterday that uh, this bill passed the um, uh, the the House and Senate in Florida, and it's basically just being. Uh, just waited on by Florida Governor Ron DeSantis to sign it into law. So we're going to be keeping an eye on that, see what happens, and see maybe if any uh, see if any other states follow suit. But guess what? We got a great resource for those uh, schools if they if they want to teach it in a holistic way, and that is socialism at a glance. Now available, you can go to Heartland.org. There's a big featured slide right there at the top. Click on it, buy your own copy of the book. Go to Amazon, just look up socialism at a glance, buy a copy there, leave a review. All of those things will help it tick up that uh, list of books that are under these certain categories and it'll help sell more of these books. Um, uh, so, Donnie, one last very brief comment. Do not underestimate it. the power of the teachers unions in pushing the socialist agenda because they are playing a vital role behind the scenes in doing this. And if you look at some of the documents that they produce, they are out and out socialists. Right, 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 right. No doubt. Um, all right. So socialism at a glance. Remember that book, ladies and gentlemen. All right. Let's move on. Let's move on to um, uh, this is the topic of polarization in America. And, and this topic kind of stemmed from a couple of recent stories that we've covered on the podcast uh, over the past few weeks. One of them was the one of the stories was the, the revolt at uh, MSNBC over the momentary hiring of <gasps> 
a Republican as a political commentator. And this was literally too much for the hacks at MSNBC to handle. So instead of allowing some diversity of opinion, they just fired the Republican. There Was there any self-awareness or outrage from the left on this story? None that I saw. A week prior to that, we talked about the manufactured outrage over Donald Trump's use of the scary sounding term bloodbath when he was talking about the how the Chinese are planning to undercut our auto industry by building electric vehicles in Mexico and just driving across the border. Most of the left, especially those hacks at MSNBC, went insane over this. Uh, they said that Trump was threatening to kill his political opponents. They were comparing him to Hitler, you know, very level headed stuff. And um, now there was a little self-awareness on this one. I saw that socialist uh, Cenk Uyghur from the Young Turks uh, tweeted, guys, you know, that's not what he said, right? But even that little island of sane sanity was met with just massive waves of vitriol from his followers on Twitter. So this led me to think again, this is a topic that we've talked about on this podcast before. Are we like irreparably polarized as a country? And there is a couple of charts that show this. Um, I should have sent you a link, Jim, but if you have them. Um, all right, here's here's a good one. Show the, show the first graph on this. Uh, this is talking about polarization in the country. And this chart right here kind of shows the party that's in power, shows it the, the little, what is that, the Y-axis has all the different presidents over the past however many decades. And then it shows the the party that's in power's approval of that president and the opposing party's approval of that president. And you see, as it gets closer to modern times, that gap in between approval ratings is steadily increasing to the point now of Joe Biden, where you've got uh, the Republicans are approving Joe Biden's work at leading the country at 6% compared to the Democrats' uh, approval rating at 83%. So that's quite a divide there. I've got a couple of other studies here. One of them is um, called AINS. It's like the American National Election Studies Organization. And they have a chart that shows a very similar thing, the effective polarization of parties, the own party and the rival party's feelings. So it, it asks them what you think about your party, what you think about the opposition's party. And this goes back, what, what does that go back to, like the early 90s? And again, a steady just divide between the two to right now where it's like the largest divide that it's ever been. There's a couple of other charts. I, I don't think I put it in the show notes that show very similar things um, about. Uh, oh, yeah. One of them. I don't I don't have this. So don't look for it, Jim. But one of them was uh, what you classify yourself as. You classify yourself as a moderate, a partisan or a strong partisan. And the people that are self-reporting themselves as strong partisan is the highest that it's ever been. And that one, that particular study, goes back to like the early 80s. Um, so Pew Research, they did another one that showed like a time lapse of like these little arcs that showed, you know, people that consider themselves like uh, Democrats or Republicans. And over time, those arcs separate, showing like a kind of a the left kind of sliding further to the left and the right sliding further to the right. So there is plenty of data to back this up. Um, in addition to just kind of the anecdotal stuff that you'll see in the media and maybe even your personal life, but there is data to back it up. So Linnea, I want your take on this first. What are your thoughts of just this general idea of polarization uh, sure. in the American discourse? First, uh, I do think that the majority of this is the media's fault. Um, I was over at a relative's house when that uh, story broke with the bloodbath thing. And it's such a mild, like normal comment to make, you know, like, oh, our economy, it's going to be a bloodbath one. Right. And I and I was over at a relative's house who are quite far to the left and they were watching MSNBC or they were watching. I don't know what channel she's on. Actually, they were watching Jen Psaki's show. Yeah. I didn't even know she MSNBC, had a show, MSNBC. but I guess she has a show. Uh, and um, she plays like actually she didn't even play a clip of trump saying it she just repeated over and over and over again that he had said uh, that you know there was going to be a bloodbath if he doesn't win and he was you know and they and they immediately launched into talking about january 6th so you can see the narrative that they're constructing with it and i and i was just like my stomach churned because i thought okay this is so like my relatives i don't believe that they believe that i'm like a lunatic um, 
you know, terrorist or something for being right wing. But I have absolutely no doubt that they think that about pretty much every other Republican who ever existed, right? <laughs> like at this point, because of the way that the media frames things. And this is, it's kind of, it, it kind of goes back to some of the socialism and some of the uh, disrespect of our uh, national founding and stuff. But there was a political reporter, Politico reporter on, again, MSNBC, um, I think like last week that said that like believing that your rights are not given to you by the government, like literally the first line in the Declaration of Independence is <laughs> a Christian nationalist belief. Of course it is. So, you know, thinking deeper than that, than the like knee jerk initial reaction that we have to a statement like that, what does this mean when she says that with a straight face? Uh, is she stupid? Um, I... I think she's probably pretty poorly educated in civics, but I don't think that she's probably stupid. I think this speaks to something a lot deeper. Um, and I've, I've heard it explained this way that, you know, we have, we have a population now where a good number of the people have convinced themselves that um, the definition of woman is not what it has been for all of time. And so how can some, how can people who think that way be expected to maintain, you know, 1776's definition of what like shall not be infringed means, right? right? So it, there is a there is a fundamental disconnect. And when that happens, then this uh, this statement that's kind of heretical to say in libertarian and conservative uh, circles becomes true. And that is that, you know, the Constitution is just a piece of paper for for like 50% of the country. You know, if you don't have that foundational set of beliefs that are that that document was based on, then you're not going to respect what's written in it. You're going to work very hard to unwind it. And I think that's a major part of why it feels or why it is that we are so disconnected right now is that there is a huge change that's gradually occurred in this country in terms of like foundational beliefs and that undermines like everything. Yeah, you know, this this kind of for me, especially listening to some of the things you were saying, reminds me of conversations that I have with Chris all the time in the office uh, about the media and the the way that things are portrayed and all of that uh, in the media. And we always talk about how it seems like the kind of the cable news left and the cable news right are like increasingly living in different universes. And uh, we had Larry Schweikart uh, at, at an event just last night at the Heartland Institute headquarters talking about his newest book. And at one point during the book, he was talking about this this kind of like gap in perceptions between like the left and the right. And the example that he used was kind of like crime in the country. And he was saying that like, you know, the right is is looking at like the cities and all of this stuff and the rampant crime and people just retail theft, just walking out of stores with grocery carts full of stuff and you name it, uh, carjackings through the roof, all of that sort of stuff. Whereas the left are getting like fed these lines that are like, actually crime's going down. And it's like, well, how do we even like come to anywhere close to a consensus on how to move forward as a country? If you're having those two stark black and white opinions on either side of the political debate, like you can't. And, and I feel like that's like time and time again, where you've got like, you turn on Fox news and they're like, you know, uh, um, super concerned about the border crisis, all these people pouring over the border, you know, all, all of the stuff. And then you turn on MSNBC to get their viewpoint of that, that, that issue. They're not talking about that issue at all. They're talking about January 6th because that's the most important thing that's ever happened in this country. And it's like, a, like, are we even living in the same universe at this point? I, yeah. I saw there was someone who's just like a normal kind of like sports guy just an average person on Twitter posting. He posted a list of like the most um, like terrifying moments in his life that he has witnessed. And he ranked January 6th above like the challenger explosion of course. as in terms of natural tra national tragedies. Like they are on a different planet at this point. And if you right. talk to someone like that face to face, I'm sure that they're, they're like totally normal, you know, until that, kind of a subject comes up and then all of a sudden you realize wow i am not 
even in the same plane of existence with this person anymore if you think that that was worse than what, you know what the, any number of other tragedies Donnie, yeah one of, one of my favorite polls uh, sorry chris but uh, this just came to mind but yeah. one of the favorite polls that we ever did with rasmussen um and i don't have this in the show notes either but just came to my head was when we were trying to gauge the kind of the perceptions of reality and then comparing that to the media that these people uh, that these people watch or whatever, and we found just time and time again on issue after issue that uh, like people that consume mostly their news through like CNN or MSNBC were just having like wildly inaccurate um, um, perceptions of reality when it comes to like police and unarmed shootings like by police officers or the amount of time that the world has left because of the threat of climate change or like a handful of other ones. And like, there were stark differences between the left and the right. Uh, but sorry, go ahead, Chris. Yeah. Uh, when you put that first graphic up and, and you, you saw those trend lines really start to diverge in the uh, mid two thousands, uh, that just so happens to be when social media, you know, really hit the, hit the scene. I think a lot of this is driven by that because what, what happens is people um, get their news from social media and it's all about algorithms and it's all about getting them to keep watching the social media platform. So it's right. not about actually informing the American people like it was back in, you know, the the quaint old days of, you know, the 1960s, 70s and 80s, even when most people got their news from, you know, like network TV. Yes, it was a little bit biased to the left, but by and large, it was generally trying to appeal to Mass all appeal. Americans. Exactly. So then, therefore, they had to kind of give you both sides of the story. I'm not saying that it was right down the middle at all. You know, even in the 1980s, you know, Sam Donaldson, you know, the way he treated Ronald Reagan was just, you know, pathetic. But I mean, it pales in comparison to nowadays where uh, most of the mainstream media actually has a an agenda. But I think that's only part of it because I think that uh, most, well, I know that most people get their news from social media. And social media is not a reputable news source. You don't, you know, I mean, I, even in my own family, I've got, you know, family members who like, they'll just say, I saw this on Facebook. It's, it's true. It's like, no, it's not. What are you talking about? But they have just become so uh, used to receiving, you know, news from those kinds of sources, which are not actual sources of, you know, like factual news that then they, you know, just be, become, uh, you know, more, more, uh, to the left or more to the right. So I think that that's a yeah. big, big, big part of this. No, I actually think that is an incredibly large part of this. And increasingly, whether, uh, just on internet, social media for sure, but uh, the content that is being delivered to you is algorithmically de uh, derived. So yes. if it sees that you are... Uh, you know, socialist left, like it's going to be feeding s stories that right. they know socialist left people want to see because it's all about attention economy and it's trying to keep you on the platform like that. And they're not going to keep you on the platform if they're just like, you know, showing you some right wing extremist stuff. You're going to get frustrated and leave. Right. That so it's like creating these massive echo chambers uh, that have probably not seen on earth until the advent of these social media and especially these like powerful algorithms. And that, again, that's seen in your Google news feed that's seen on your Facebook timeline that's seen on uh, recommended posts on, on uh, X or Twitter uh, recommended videos on TikTok or YouTube or any number of those things. It's just driving this. Like if you're not even seeing what the other side of the aisle is talking about, then how do you even know like where they're coming from or how to even fight back against their arguments or anything? And I will say, um, you know, while I'm saying that it seems like it's a left and right thing and it is for sure it is, but I also think that it's um, like very much affects the left more because for the right, we don't have the privilege of existing solely in an echo chamber because of like <laughs> the mass media. And if you just true. watch TV or movies, like you get a baseline of just like anti-Trump well, stuff at the very least. And, but, and Donnie, and it's been proven in polls too. Um, uh, leftists and right wingers have been polled on like describe your opponent's perspectives from their point of view and time and again the right is able to articulate with detail what the left believes accurately but the left is unable to do that for the right wing exactly and it's it's very strange and i think you touched on the reason why it is that way it's because the general culture is to the left so they're not getting like act like exposed by um osmosis to those ideas from the right they think that like 
Fox News is far right, which is laughable at this point in time. Like, yeah. it, so it's yeah. You know, Have you ever I, had the unfortunate uh, pleasure of going on to like Reddit, which is just an absolute cesspool. It's like goodness, you read some of the these worst. like these posts and it's like, have you ever met a Republican like in real life? Have you ever actually met a Republican or somebody that's conservative? Because I don't think you have. Uh, Chris, we're at an hour, so I'll give you final thoughts on any of the topics uh, that we've talked about so far. Yeah, you mentioned, you know, Larry Schweikert's parents uh, here at the Harlan Institute last night, and he wrote a new book and it's called uh, globalism. It's called the uh, the rise and fall. And he was making the argument that globalism is in decline. And I wish I would have asked him this question during the Q and A session: How technology is going to uh, play into that? Because I think that technology, whether it's AI, quantum computing, algorithms, just like all this stuff, is actually going to make it even easier for people who want to implement global control over the masses to do it. And I think that what we're seeing here in the United States is almost like a test run of sorts to that, where they are just you know, inundating people with social media messages. And we've seen now that there is a direct relationship between the US government and social media platforms to say, this is the narrative we want to put forward. Therefore, you're gonna put it forward or we're gonna make your life very difficult. And whether it was the pandemic or the 2020 election or just you know time after time, they're able to use their uh, you know technological uh, monopoly to their advantage. And I think that's just a, yet another reason why it's just people are just going more and more into their separate corners because I think that many people on the on the right side of the spectrum say, geez, we feel like we're under siege these days. It's like, it's just, it's coming at us from all angles. Right. And then I think that also emboldens the people on the left to say, man, we're making a lot of you know progress here. Let's just keep going with this. And then it's just gonna make them do it more and more and more. So we're kind of in a uh, vicious uh, cycle of sorts. Oh yeah, yeah. That, that uh, you know, you know me, Chris. I mean, that is right up my alley. And um, I do wanna do an episode, like a full episode dedicated to the idea of like digital dictatorships. Yes. Um, but that's that's for a future episode. Linnea, any last words? Anything you want to get off your chest before we wrap up the show? Nope, I think we covered it all really well. Yes, yes, absolutely. Thank you for being on, by the way. And I want to thank oh, everyone for, having me. for joining us for this episode of the In the Tank podcast. Join us every week for a new episode. If, uh, if you're listening to this, you're probably catching it on a Friday or later. And if you are an audio only listener, leave a review for us on iTunes. That'd be greatly appreciated. Also, you could join us live where we are streaming this on Facebook and YouTube and X and Rumble. And you can join the conversation, throw your comments and questions on the screen uh, in the chat. Maybe we'll show your comments on the screen. Maybe we'll address your questions on the fly. You can support the show by uh, doing a whole bunch of different things. We have that super chat functionality enabled if you want to support the show that way. Or if you want to just spend a couple of seconds, you can just share this video, subscribe if you haven't already, hit that like button, or uh, leave a comment in the video. All those things help break through those big tech algorithms that prevent content like this from being shown to more people. If you'd like, you can follow us on X at In The Tank Pod, or you can send us your comments questions and suggestions for the show by emailing us at in the tank podcast at gmail.com Linnea Lucan where can the fine people find you um right now I am on the uh, other cesspit that is uh, Twitter at Linnea Lucan um, and also you can read some of our work that we put out from the Robinson Center at climaterealism.com perfect and she will also be on the climate realism oh, that's show right on you Heartland's main YouTube channel on Fridays at noon central time. Chris Talgo, what do you have to pitch today? Well, Harlan.org. Tons of great content up there. Fantastic. And of course, check out that new book. Link to it right there. It's QR code. Scan that. It'll bring you right to the Amazon page to buy your own copy of Socialism at a Glance. But thank you all for tuning in and we will talk to you next week. He's a lion dog-faced pony soldier.